Welcome back to the Business Systems Summit. I'm your host, David Jennings, and in this session, we're going to be chatting with Glenn Carlson. He's the co-founder from Dent Global, and it's uh, with great honor that we get to have them as one of our key sponsors for the event. So no doubt you'll hear more about them. They have worked with many of the speakers for the uh, summit, both past and present, people like David Dugan, Andrew Griffiths, Tim Reed. All of those work with Dent and have worked with Dent in the past. And they've got a range of different programs, courses, and accelerators. Um, they've launched three best-selling books. One of the most well-known is this one right here. I've got my copy, uh, Key Person of Influence. And back in the day, my video production company filmed many of their events and workshops. I've just watched the company grow in leaps and bounds over the years. Uh, they've now got offices in the UK, US, Singapore, Australia, thousands of clients around the world, and they've amassed a huge number of case studies and success stories. And I feel like that's the real true measure of their success is having hundreds of detailed stories of how business owners have been able to stand out from the crowd, follow their systematic approach to becoming what they call a key person of influence. And now Glenn, he, he plays a real key part in this. I've watched him speak many times before. Love his very actionable content. So it's with great pleasure that I get to welcome him to the summit. Welcome, Glenn Carlson. Thanks very much for having me. Now, Glenn, I know there's going to be a lot that we're going to cover and we're going to go through the key person of influence system. So as a way to start, I love, um, yeah, I'd love it if you could share the, the challenge or the problem that you see this particular system that it aims to, to solve for business owners. And then we can kind of go through that process step by step. Absolutely. So the problem is pretty simple. It's that the vast majority of business owners uh, have developed a skill set or an expertise or a product or a service or a piece of technology uh, that solves a problem in a meaningful way. So they've got that bit covered. They're in business, they're making sales, maybe they've hired some team, they've been developing systems and trying to make a successful, thriving, profitable business. And yet they're finding that they're really struggling to get cut through in the market, uh, they're struggling to get the kind of visibility they need for their audience, um, and they tend to have long sales cycles, lots of price competition. There are actually quite a lot of alternatives out there in the market for what they offer. And so despite being good at what they do, they're really struggling to get the cut through and really realize the value that they feel like and I believe that they deserve as well for the work and the effort and the quality that they put in. And we see a lot of business owners spending a lot of money on things like you know, rebranding their websites or launching new websites or launching online membership programs or courses or hiring a marketing person or a salesperson and you know, just doing all this general you know, business development, business building stuff. And yet when I survey small business owners about the return on investment that they get from that expenditure, uh, the juice, they feel like the juice is very rarely worth the squeeze on all those sorts of things. And so one of the things that we've seen um, as being the primary differentiator is the degree to which that business is showing up as one of the go-to brands in their industry, right? Not a fancy window dressing type veneer in the sense that they've got a pretty logo or a good looking website, uh, but to what degree are they as the founder uh, or their product or service or business recognized as that go-to source? So their names come up in conversation, they're connected to all the right people in all the right ways, but ultimately the measurables is that they're attracting inbound opportunity, they've got a low cost of acquisition, it's easy for them to find clients, it's easy for them to find team, it's easy for them to retain that team um, because the team wanna feel like they're working with a cool business that's up to something. And so what we really see is that until you're that go-to brand, or at least one of them, everything else is way harder, right? You could have two different businesses, one of them that's already has the assets of influence and they're showing up as quite visible, one of them that's fairly unknown, but both of them doing the exact same quality of work, let's say they're accountants or something, well, the cost of acquiring a new team member, 
or the cost of getting a return on Facebook advertising or you know, the cost of acquiring a customer is going to be much, much, much less for that business that has that visibility as opposed to the one that doesn't. And so for the last almost decade, we've been, I guess, relentlessly exploring how to most effectively take these businesses that have already established value and repackage it in such a way that they start showing up as that visible, valuable kind of go-to brand. Um, and the question is, how do we do it without the founder needing to be an extrovert or like a, a, a video expert or a shameless self-promoter, right? So while we need the attention of a wide audience, that just makes sense. You know, Apple would never be Apple if it wasn't able to capture the attention of a very wide audience. We need to do it without seeking attention because no one likes an attention seeker. Um, so those are the problems or I guess the circles that we look to square with our programs and our advisory. I think what I love watching as you guys have developed, you've really just focused in on this one particular thing, gone very deep then to, to identify what these key assets are and characteristics and then you've been able to assemble it in a, a system or a process so someone can systematically work through getting these key components of influence in place so where do you start like what's the first step in this process well i guess the first step is to recognize that um, there is established underlying value and underutilized intellectual property right so um, if you're a startup or an apprentice, brand new to an industry, no track record, no experience, um, this isn't the place to start at all, right? You want to go to back to the basics of, you know, sales, picking up the phone, proving that you can actually solve the value for customers. If you're there, right, so if mm. the value has already been established, um, there are five key steps that we have seen is by far the most effective way to follow this sequence and this system through a proven process for, for generating the results. And it starts with your pitch, which is great because that's just the words that you use, right? Um, and yet your words fractal through everything from your marketing to your slide decks to your website to emails that you send to the response to when people ask you you know what do you do you know our our pitch is everything um, and yet very few businesses are pitch perfect very few businesses have considered um, how they actually answer the question in a way that differentiates them from their competition. We, I mean, really what we're talking about is how do you answer the question, what do you do in a way that makes me want to work with you and pay a premium to work with you over the competition? And very, very few business owners spend anywhere near enough time um, working on that problem. So that would be the mm -hmm. first step, clarifying your own value and encapsulating it into that kind of core value proposition that you want to focus on. A simple maybe example from our own perspective is that you mentioned we really focused on this key person of influence stuff. Now, we have a lot of generic business skills and, and we don't focus on this because we don't have other options. We could very easily package up a program that would help businesses develop their culture or you know, um, work on their entrepreneurial mindset or any of this sort of stuff if we thought that was going to be the thing that would make a big difference. Um, the fact is, is that we saw that the biggest problem that we could solve that would have the biggest impact for our clients was this idea of helping them stand out in their industry. So from a pitching perspective, we needed to work out, well, stand out in your industry is, is just a, an explanation. How can we also create like a, a, a term like key person of influence that we can own? We can actually own that, become our intellectual property. Everything around that kind of focused packaging of the message gets encapsulated in your pitch all the way through to being able to own it um, through you know, intellectual property law, etc. So next step is if you're really great at your pitch, you'll attract more business, you'll attract more people wanting to refer people to you even if they've never worked with you, right? Because the value is so nicely packaged. So you'll start to see 
some nice inbound opportunity, but only so much because you will be the person delivering the pitch. So step two is how do we take the core value from that pitch and how do we publish it through thought leadership content through as many channels as possible so essentially we can cast a wider net. So publishing is essentially um, augmenting the role of traditional sales and marketing. Traditional sales and marketing is just about getting yourself in front of people in a way where they're engaged, they're interested, they're learning about the value proposition of your particular product or service. Um, we don't want to pay people to do that because people are expensive. Um, we want to develop business assets or marketing assets to do that, like our books and our podcast and our you know digital scorecards and blogs and content and articles and videos and on it goes. So any content that takes the core idea of that pitch and shares it with the world is what we would call publishing. Uh, we've also produced about 800 business authors, so that can include writing a book, but it doesn't have to include writing a book. It's just anything that's getting that pitch to scale, publish content. So those first two steps are, are pretty important because they confirm proof of audience, right? And if we're going to then develop a product, which is the third step or a product ecosystem, we need to be building that around a proof of audience. There's no point us putting time, energy, and financial resources into building out a product like the Key Person of Influence program or any other product if we can't build proof of audience because if you can't create a market that are at least interested in the general value proposition of what you do, well, then there's no point overcapitalizing in producing a product that you can't attract attention for anyway. So that's why we like those first two steps to come first. And look, most of our clients have already established that core product, but what we want to do is a few things. A, we want to decouple the delivery process from the founder's time, ideally from time in general, right? And so even if it's a service business, so my business is a service business, it's humans working with other humans to help them solve problems. It's not a widget that we're, that we're selling. And yet there is a structured format, a process, a system, if you will, to be able to take whatever the essential value is when one is selling their time and to create a process and a package around that where ultimately, if it's appropriate, every business is different, to be able to have systems, processes, or other people delivering that process on your behalf. One of my mentors, a good mate of mine, says, look, the first two things that every business owner has to do is they have to get out of sales and they have to get out of delivery, right? Really, if, you, if you're stuck in sales yourself or you're stuck in delivery yourself, you're really constraining yourself to the paradigm of a very small business model, um, usually one or two people tops because you'll, you'll cap out. Um, then what we want to do is take what we did in publish and we want to surround that core product the product that you get known for. We call it a signature product uh, with a product ecosystem. So again, that's what I was talking about, the books, the blogs, the articles, which, which is very easy for people to consume. It's very easy for you to build a wide audience, which allows people to consume more and more value at a deeper, deeper level until such time as they're working in your core uh, product or service, which delivers the complete uh, solution, which is usually the most expensive and the most profitable thing that you offer. Um, from there and only from there do we then transition into working on profile. Uh, so most people, um, <laughs> most people that approach profile do it completely wrong. They make it all about them and they're looking to make themselves the hero. Uh, we do not recommend doing that at all. We don't believe in having a faceless organization. We believe that the founder, it's, it's our responsibility to lead from the front, um, to publicly represent and stand for our vision, our values, and our value proposition. Um, but the moment we make ourselves the hero, we move into a very dicey environment where it's very, very easy for us to alienate uh, an audience to show up as a self promoter. So your profile isn't about you. You mentioned at the start our case studies, right? So our goal from the start was to not be the hero. It was to be known by the success of our clients. 
Um, and that's what profile is all about. So when I started focusing on profile for our own business, my goal was how do I show up in the media, whether it's in articles or in TV, showcasing our clients' successes. And that was my objective and that's what we did. So when I was interviewed by Inc. or the Sydney Morning Herald or Sky News, yes, they were interviewing me, but the primary feature of all of the conversations was the transformations that we'd be creating for our clients. I, I like to think of profile like Oprah. Oprah doesn't make it about her. She doesn't do social media about her whole private life. She's using the attention that she gets because of her personality and the way that she communicates the vision, the values, the value proposition. And then she shines the light on her guest or the charity or the book of the week or the cause. And because she's so humble about it, even more people give her great attention, right? And so the cycle continues. Um, so we break profile down into four elements, social media, awards and accolades, live appearances, and third-party media. And if you focus on building assets around that, yes, you need some social media presence. Um, however, I do not believe you need anywhere near the activity that a lot of social media spruikers uh, put out. I don't use social media personally at all. I don't post a lot about my personal life. I mean, the big things. So recently had a baby. Um, that went up on my personal page. Uh, before that, got engaged, that went up on my personal page, and I don't think there's much at all in between. And so from a social media perspective, it's just making sure you're relevant, right? We see certainly Google, if you're going to, if a celebrity client or a major brand partner is considering working with you, they're going to Google you. And so the question is what shows up? Okay, and we just want to make sure that from a social media perspective, you're showing up as relevant enough that that major opportunity, whoever or whatever they are, can look at you and go, okay, no, they're paying attention to the some of the important things. Um, awards and accolades. Um, most people are very shy and, and bashful and, you know, it's the humble Aussie battler kind of, oh, I'm just going to do a good job and if someone wants to tap me on the shoulder and you know, say, well done, I'll accept it, but I won't go out of my way to do that. Well, that's kind of like saying I wouldn't go out of my way to find a quality team member that's going to great build great value for my business and serve my clients in more meaningful ways. It doesn't make sense. If there are assets that we can acquire and develop, they're going to help our audience make a decision to work with us, help our team make a decision to work with us, etc. Well, we want to go out of our way to develop those assets. And Winning awards, whether they're fast growth awards or leadership awards or product development awards or innovation in export awards, like there are over 950 different awards we can win just in Australia, right? And I know this yeah. is an audience. So I highly encourage you or delegate it to one of your team, explore what might be the three or four awards that you could look at um, submitting an application for over the next couple of years and make it a point to either become a finalist or a winner of a series of those. Now, what's great is that 95% of businesses that are submitting award submissions have no real clarity around their pitch or why they're different or unique. They have no kind of remarkable published content. They have no clearly defined product ecosystem. They're just people out there doing business. So when we can come and start submitting an award submission, which is effectively a pitch, um, layering all those elements, all of a sudden you're not competing with 100% of the submissions. You might be competing with only about 5%. And it goes the same with accolades. So when we were named as uh, by Inc. as um, one of the world's leading business accelerators, that was an accolade. So it was a third party referencing the quality of what we do and that third party is known, liked and trusted by our audience because everyone's kind of heard of Inc. Uh, another one of our clients, uh, for example, Andrew Bycroft is a cybersecurity expert. By going through our program, he made a list of what would be the type of publications or people that if they were to give him an acknowledgement or an endorsement, it would be a big deal. And for him, it was the Wall Street Journal. 
going through a process. They ended up writing an article where they named him one of the world's leading cybersecurity experts. Now, you can kind of see what this starts to look like on a brochure, a slide deck, or a website where it's the world's leading cybersecurity ex expert as per the Wall Street Journal. Well, that all of a sudden just starts to open doors that would not normally open. So we consider that to be a very important business asset. Social media, sure. Awards and accolades, sure. But then live appearances, um, whether it's in something like this or whether it's at a live event or an industry relevant event, whether you're simply a MC um, on behalf of a charity or an organization that's relevant to your industry, in some way you want to be publicly showing up, representing the vision, values, value proposition. And of course, third party media, as I've kind of mentioned a few times. Um, other people seeing that your content is worthy of distribution mm. helps people decide they want to work with you, right? It's that social proof type of a, uh, a tick. And finally, um, the fifth step is around joint ventures, partnerships, and alliances. And I think, you know, at least 80 to 90% of small businesses are in some way actively looking to create partnerships and yet they tend to do it uh, really poorly because they're not yet showing up as that key person of influence. Um, you tend to have no name, unknown business owners partnering and collaborating with other unknown business owners. And so the leverage effect is very, very small. Um, our goal with ourselves and our clients is how do we partner with some of the biggest, most respected and trusted blue chip brands and personal brands either in your industry, in the country, or in the world. And most small businesses just aren't compatible with those level of partnerships because they don't have the positioning to justify it. And yet, once a business starts to show up as the go-to brand led by a key person of influence, well, all of a sudden, the big brands, the big players, and the existing influencers start being open to the idea of collaboration. And that's where we start to see not just some real exponential growth, and I'm talking sort of 10x returns that people will often see their companies go through, um, but it really starts to sort of cement you in that inner circle of your industry. All of a sudden, you're the key person of influence, you're the go-to brand, and you're attracting partnership opportunities, you're attracting team, you're attracting clients because you've built the assets of influence in a systemized way. So that's the short yeah. story. Now, uh, the slightly longer version, I'd love to go through um, each one of those points and just get a few like key action items. And it makes perfect sense that we're talking about someone who already has an established business. They've already got some runs on the board because that then enables them to, you know, put themselves in their target audience's shoes, really think about what's going on for that individual. What are the challenges? What are the conversations that are going on in their head? And that can help for them to craft the message that speaks so clearly to that person that when someone says it, you can't help but you know look and go, oh, wow, this is interesting. They, they understand me deeply. So for that first step, yep. um, when it comes to kind of getting the perfect pitch, what, what does the outcome look like when someone goes through the key person of influence program? Is this a, a written down A4 bit of paper that talks about avatar and, you know, a, a sentence or two or how does, how does that look and, and, and I suppose to point someone in the direction, what should they be thinking about to get this step down? Yeah, great. So I'll, I'll go through in some more detail, but no, it's not one particular, it's not like an elevator pitch because frankly, when have you ever had to really pitch what you do in an elevator or even really in 30 seconds? No, it's not about that. It's more about having a base plate of the value proposition that you know, if you're creating a Facebook ad or a tweet or a position description, uh, for your business, you've got the core value proposition that positions you as unique and different, and it can go anywhere from a 15-second answer to the question, what do you do at a dinner party where you don't want to sound like a weird spruker desperate for new business, and it's just like a casual response, but at least it's interesting, all the way through to maybe a 90-minute keynote talk if you're asked to present in, in front of an audience. Um, 
Look, I think in an environment like this, instead of me going through sort of the like the eight step pitching mm-hmm. structure, which might be a little bit too intense and it requires too much um, personal backwardsing and forwardsing, we do a lot of one to one work uh, with our clients to sharpen this. Let me zoom up to probably the 80 20 rule of what is the biggest thing people are getting wrong and what's yeah. the fastest way that they could improve their pitch by 80%. Um, without having to try too hard. Um, And the answer to that is, if you think of the analogy, that people don't buy drill bits, they buy holes, right? In the same way that if someone's charging by the hour, people don't really want your time. Your time is just a means to an end. They want the end. They want the outcome. They want the result. And so what we really aim to do with our clients is to help them isolate the difference between their drill bit and the hole. So let me give you an example of one of our our clients, uh, Clarissa Raywood. So she's a successful family lawyer. When we first met, she probably had about seven on the team, was spending a lot of time in, uh, in the courtroom and she was starting to feel a disconnect in terms of her integrity around how that whole industry kind of works, right? Especially the effects divorce can have on kids and all that sort of stuff. And her original pitch was kind of simple. My name's Clarissa. I'm a family lawyer. um, And I specialize in helping families navigate the complexities of, you know, divorce. It's kind of like a boilerplate explainer of what I do. And you could replace that with I'm an accountant and I help businesses navigate the complexities of tax or I'm an interior designer and I help, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's just that boilerplate explainer of what what is done. When we worked with Clarissa to kind of go, what do people really want? This actually inspired her to change kind of her entire focus of business as well. And that often happens is that really people don't want to go to war. Maybe their monkey reptile brain does in the moment, but certainly if they've got kids, more than smiting their their uh, their partner, they want to look after their kids. And so she ended up writing the book and changing her own whole pitch to this idea of, yes, she's still a family lawyer and has a, fam- a legal team, um, but she takes people through a mediation process where she helps people separate, stay out of court, and stay friends, which is the clincher. Now, the thing we love about that, selling the drill bit is very time, uh, present time based. It's this is, what's, this is what I do right now. As opposed to a great pitch should be future based from the perspective of the customer. So I help families navigate the complexities of the courtroom is a what I do now. Helping my clients separate, stay out of court and stay friends is the ideal state they want in the future. And it's been designed, it's been encapsulated. She ended up calling her book Splitsville, How to Separate, Stay Out of Court and Stay Friends. And that becomes a idea that she can own. Another example, um, if we've got time, is uh, a client of ours, a business coach, Martin Norbury. Right? And his original pitch is, well, I help businesses scale, which is kind of what, well, let's say a lot of business coaches might say. It's almost a generic response. We worked with, and he ended up writing the book called I Don't Work Fridays. Right Now, this statement of I don't work Fridays became the goal that he would work with all of his clients to help them eventually be able to say, to their mates. He'd work with people that are working six day weeks. He'd get them down to four day weeks. But he went from saying, I'm a business coach and this is what I do to this is the outcome that I help my clients achieve in the future. Now, the, my recommendation is simple. Um, first of all, I would encourage you to audit your competitors and have a look at are they spending most of their time presenting and pitching the drill bit or the hole. The good news is 95% of your competition, whoever you are listening in, are going to be pitching the drill bit. It is easier. It's what we know. Um, we're, we're typically a little more comfortable talking about like 
the physical, tangible things, even if we offer an intangible service, because it's ours, we know it, we're comfortable with it. Key people of influence, however, tend to be very good at communicating the power of an idea. They communicate future states, which are often less tangible when we first start thinking about them. So one of our jobs as an organization is to help our clients spend some real deep work, some deep time clarifying what is the future state that you want to move your customer towards that when they achieve that state, that is when they know they've had the win, that is when they know they've had the victory. So for us, when you're showing up as a highly valued, highly paid key person of influence in your industry, that's when you got what you paid for. So if you go through an audit your competition, you'll realize, wow, they're all doing it the old way. If you then put a little bit of energy into auditing yourself and seeing how you can move the needle from having a bias towards the drill bit, present state about you, to having a bias towards what your customer really wants, future state about them, you will hit the 80-20 rule when it comes to improving your pitch. Yeah, perfect. And then shifting into um, that next stage around published content, um, and there's so many different ways to do this. Do you have like a, uh, either a minimum framework that someone should be thinking about as far as volume or is it just about consistency? Um, and, and I know um, also when we start to think about raising the profile as well, we sort of start to talk about posting content on other platforms, but specifically for the published content, that's second stage. Yeah, what are the steps that you kind of guide someone through here? Yeah, so look again, without getting caught in too much micro uh, detail, uh, because I mean, you can you can jump online and Google like you know, how to write an article uh, pretty easily. Um, the thing that I often find is one of the reasons people don't produce content, well, there's two big reasons. One is they don't feel like that what they have to say is good enough or unique enough or different enough or whatever it is. Uh, that's the big one. The second one, which is equally as big, is they don't have the time, right? They're not a writer and often they've sat down to kind of write a blog and four and a half hours later, they're still tweaking the intro. You know, it was a dark and stormy night. It's like, no, delete. The night was dark and stormy, you know, and it's this... It's this analysis, paralysis, perfectionism, which is really just a cover for fear of putting this thing out there, so we'll keep tinkering with it. Um, the reality is it's not one or two pieces of content that's going to change your business. It's like a thousand bits of content. So uh, you need to uh, not think of yourself as a content creator. You need to think of your company as a media company or at least having a division. So in the same way, we have a sales division, a marketing division, an operations um, division, a delivery division, um, an IT division, etc. We also have a media division. Um, now that could be a part-time virtual assistant helping you repurpose some stuff, right? Um, but the idea is we want everyone thinking about themselves as a media company. So step one would be to zoom up to the first problem, which is I don't feel any of our stuff is good enough. First things first, you don't need to be the super thought leader to be able to share content that's going to be really relevant to your audience. Um, one of the things that I find is that when people are in sales mode, so you put a business owner in front of a prospect and let's say that prospect is a friendly buyer, they want to buy, they've just got five or six things that they don't understand, some questions, things of that nature that they've got to ask to fully understand that this is the right thing and the right fit for them. And so they'll ask these things. And you know what? A lot of these things will show up in the way of an objection, which is just a way of them unconsciously saying, I don't understand the value of this yet, and so I need to push back in the only way I know. So it might be an objection around time or money or knowledge or experience or whatever stops people from acting. And then there's going to be a whole bunch of conversations around helping people understand the value. Typically, what we find is the best content to publish is the type of content that business owners or their sales team are talking to their prospects about all day, every day, anyway. 
right? So um, by case in point, David, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking to you about and your audience about now, if I was to meet someone cold, a business owner that was great at what they did, like I said at the start, struggling to get cut through, there's actually quite a lot of found, uh, foundational principles that I need to layer through to help them really understand the value proposition of my core business, which is why they should invest the time, energy, resources in doing like a 12-month program that kind of rebuilds their whole business from the ground up. Like that's not a small commitment. And so I don't need to be a thought leader. I don't need to be Seth Godin to publish content that's going to help people recognize that, ah, yeah, actually me being a go-to person is a, is a good idea. Um, you take that idea on top of shifting your pitch to talk more about the outcome and the whole than the drill bit, and all of a sudden you've got more than enough content that's going to be really relevant for your ideal customer. Um, a few other things that I'd recommend. I'd recommend an app called Rev. Um, so I'm sure you'd be familiar with it, but a lot of people still aren't. I find that so, certainly a lot of our clients, we're not writers, but we're pretty good at talking, right? So if we're to be interviewed or um, if we're to deliver a small workshop or a presentation, we tend to be all right at doing that. So our recommendation is record those things send them off to rev.com, which will transcribe all of that audio for a dollar a minute. Then we recommend jump on upwork.com and find yourself a journalist because all journalists now, typically there's still a glut of journalists that are incredibly highly skilled because of their training 20 or 30 years ago, but super underpaid these days. So find one of those um, in your particular area or that has a skill set or a background writing. So, you know, if you're in business, find a business journalist. If you're in property, find a property journalist that can take your raw um, recording and turn that into a short form article. So if you, let's say, allocate 50 bucks for that process, which are 25 bucks an hour, a couple of hours, but they're just tweaking messaging that you've already got reasonably tight, well, all of a sudden you're able to produce an article for less than 50 bucks. Now, of course, that is a much better use of your time to spend $50 for the finished product than it is to spend four hours um, trying to write the thing yourself because you can spit out one or two of them all week, uh, every week. And that's just the basics in yeah. stuff. think like a publishing media company. If you can get good at video, right, if you can get good at talking to a teleprompter or just riffing rants into a video, whatever your style is, the beauty of getting good at video is that that one video, you can then have images pulled off that, you can have audio pulled off that, you can have articles created from that, you can have that turned into slide decks, you can have that published on, it's, it's the, the alpha of all of the media categories because it can be converted into every other media format whereas every other media format can't. So, of course, if you write an article, there's no visuals associated. You can't reverse engineer visuals uh, into that very easily. Um, and so the way I recommend people get good at video, and I do recommend getting good at video, is to plan to delete 500 takes um, before you even think of publishing anything. A lot of people, you know, they do one or two takes and they publish this awkward jolty, uncomfortable kind of thing, which is absolutely having the reverse effect. Um, the beauty of video is you can convert, com communicate so much in such a small period of time, but it's, it's worth getting good at. And again, people can Google, you know, video tips and go down that rabbit hole. Um, but it's definitely a skill that I recommend. So that's sort of our top level approach to thinking about publishing content. Obviously, if you're going to go through uh, and start creating like a proper video channel or um, to become a contributor in a publication or to write a book, all of the things we help our clients engineer, um, there's a substantial amount of depth and structure required to doing that efficiently. But those would be my recommendations mm -hmm. at a top level.
And it feels like one of the biggest things here is just consistency, kind of finding the channel and the method and the process that works well for you and then doing it over time. That's the only way that you're going to improve. And then you start to have a look at repurposing, resharing and getting it out there. So it kind of feels like now, I mean, you can start to see we're crafting the message, make sure it's going to connect right. We're then um, creating the content, which then helps us get that message out there. Uh, and then, okay, at this point, we've got people engaging in the content. They're seeing what we're doing. We're doing it over a consistent basis. Now we need something to sell them. And that kind of goes into that um, product ecosystem. Um, and you mentioned, and maybe the 80-20 of this next step is around the signature product. I don't sure. know if you if you can touch on a few key points on how you'd go about developing that signature product. Yeah. So um, the signature product is this idea of what is the core product that you want to get famous for, like that you want to be known for. And the first thing is considering what is the complete and remarkable solution to a customer's real meaningful problem. The reason I say that is a core product needs to have a minimum of $2,000 gross profit per transaction baked into it. So if you're a coach and you're selling an $800 consulting session or a $200 consulting session, there's no profit in that. Um, and if you're going to start building a machine or a business around that, the costs of acquiring that customer won't be covered in such a small unit price. So we need to build something valuable um, for people and really considering what is the complete and remarkable solution. So again, if you're a consultant and you're going in and you're doing a couple of sessions with someone, is that really a complete and remarkable solution to a meaningful problem? And the answer, of course, is no. So another client of ours, Catherine Maslin, uh, she is a naturopath up in Brisbane um, and she was selling her time and her team's time to do naturopathy. Uh, so, of course, people would come in, she'd do a nat naturopathy session for like 130 bucks or something along those lines. But if we freeze frame right there, is that really a complete and remarkable solution to a meaningful problem? No, it's essentially you're a dispenser for some health supplements. What Catherine really wanted to do is transform people's health over the long term. To do that, she wrote a book called Get Well, Stay Well. And the paradigm she needed her content, her published content to shift in people was most people, they only go to a healthcare practitioner when they're sick or tired or ill. Um, she wanted to change that to you only show up when you're feeling great, right? So when you're feeling great, keep going to a healthcare practitioner because what that will compound to over time is a totally vital, alive kind of state. Um, and what she did is she took her charging by the hour approach and she changed it into a 12-month membership. So instead of charging uh, 150 odd bucks an hour, she now charges about $7,000 for an annual subscription to an unlimited amount of naturopathy, massage, acupuncture, and a whole suite of other solutions packaged into that. Plus, there's layers of accountability, coaching, feedback loops, because she's not selling naturopathy sessions anymore, which is the drill bit. She's selling a complete and remarkable solution and she has reverse engineered her business to deliver against that complete remarkable solution. And that's just done a few things, right? So the, the first thing is it's allowed her revenue to increase substantially. But more importantly, because people are paying a subscription, she has a recurring revenue model built into the business, which isn't just all about her profiteering, although she's making a hell of a lot more profit and take home income personally, but because they now stand for something, they exist to deliver a powerful outcome for their customers, they now have the financial capacity and stability in their organization to deliver a far more compelling service to their customers than they could when they were literally chasing these sort of little sessions, not to mention the fact that the customers are now experiencing way more defined transformations. Their referrals have just gone 
through the roof. And every year they have over an 80% um, retention rate on those memberships. So that is a great example of taking a time-based service and packaging it into a valuable outcome-based productized service. And of course, when it was just Catherine, the naturopath, she was spending 80, 90% of her time on the tools working in the business, so to speak. But now that she's not selling her time, she's selling an outcome. People don't expect to work personally with Catherine. They expect to experience the product or the, the experience of the 12 month transformation that they take people through of which Catherine brings in other experts to deliver the key elements of that value, elevating her to the level of business owner, true business owner working on the business, not in the business and influencer where it is a better use of her time to be the author, the speaker, the media commentator, getting that message of recurring health out to people rather than recurring illness. So if I could kind of break it down Barney style, the work that needs to happen, you're now seeing a bit of a, a match between the pitch and the product. What is that end state? What is that complete remarkable solution? And ideally, how would you measure that? Like how would someone actually measure it? And so one of the things Catherine now does is she runs very comprehensive diagnostics um, on you know, blood and urine and you know all the minerals and what have you so they can actually track progress over time as well as subjective levels like you know, sense of health, well-being, vitality, et cetera, that are, are more difficult to quantify and they track that over time so they can take a survey before and they can take a survey every quarter and actually reflect back and demonstrate like a, a financial advisor should be able to do for your money um, Catherine and her team can now do with your health now we've helped interior designers accountants our own business going to go through this process but the starting point is what is the outcome how do you define that outcome so that would be step one um, and I and I would also say just making sure it's not a list of, of benefits like oh they're more highly value valued and paid and they're standing out in their industry like I could list a hundred benefits of being a, a key person of influence but when I'm talking about packaging a proven process or a production process to achieve that result we have to start to really quantify it uh, and define it the second step would be to create a proven process poster out of it. So literally mapping out exactly what people get and when people get it and what's involved in them getting it. Is it going to be an online thing? Are they going to get time with you or one of your team? Are they going to get a workbook? If so, how many pages in the workbook? Are they going to get you know, supplementary video materials? If so, how many hours of videos? Like really, really specific in terms of exactly what someone's gonna get. And ideally, structuring that kind of like Henry Ford would structure um, a production line. You know, you wanna have what is step one, what is step two, what is step three, what is step four, that if someone follows those steps with you, that will lead to that complete and remarkable solution at the end. Once you've got that on a, on a visual document, um, the ability for then for you to then communicate to your prospect that you're not selling time, you're not selling a service, you're selling a robust and well thought through process, almost like an operating system. Um, and all of a sudden, the experience of the customer completely transforms, right? Because they're not trying to work out how you and your time are going to help the outcome. You've displayed to them a proven production process that's going to help them get the result they want. So all of a sudden, their level of certainty goes up that, that they're in the right place to get the outcome, but also their desire for your time drops as well because they never wanted your time in the first place. It was just the means to that end, but now you've presented them with a better means 
to that end, a more tangible, structured, high confidence means to an end, they prefer to take that. And that is where we see business owners often for the first time really being able to take substantial steps in rolling themselves out of the business. So step one, what's the outcome? Step two, what is the production process in achieving that outcome and then pricing it? Well, that's a, I guess, a whole different story, but the pricing wants to be based more on the upside value to a customer and less on the the unit cost or time cost of delivery. Yeah, I think uh, the message in this particular step will resonate really well with the audience because that's really we focus heavily in on the extraction first and you have to start on that primary product first. That makes sense. And as we've seen with um, key person of influence as well, you guys are a great example of, of this in action as well over time as the product line starts to grow and you bring out things like 24 assets and some of the other programs that you've got, but you have to start with one. You need that central place that um, that's, that's where everybody gets started. And then it's almost like as someone goes through a particular program, you, they might start to recognize other problems that they have that you then have solutions for, at which point you've built such a great relationship with them. And it's more, how can we help you rather than what can we sell you? So that that feels perfect. As we move to that that next step, I feel like earlier we did cover the raise your profile quite well because there were basically those um, four key elements. Um, when, when we think about the, the last stage in the process um, as far as the partnerships, unless you had any other extra points you wanted to add on to the, the raising of the profile, actually, again, thinking 80-20. Yeah, um, so thinking 80-20 uh, around raising your profile, the acronym is SALT. Right? Are you worth your salt in your industry? So S-A-L-T, social media, awards and accolades, live appearances and third-party media. The other reason we use the acronym SALT is that SALT on its own is disgusting. Right? You're building a profile if it's not backed up with a great product ecosystem, a published content ecosystem and a powerful pitch is gross. It just makes you look like a shameless self-promoter. Right? So best to work on those first three steps first. Inside the SALT acronym, we recommend working on the first step last, right? So a lot of people default to social media to raise their profile and it's just adding more noise to a noisy environment and my experience is it works against more people than it serves. Better to focus on more uh, uh, the steps that have more gravitas. If you think of social media is more of a microphone whereas the singer the actual caliber and quality um, of the song or the vocalist is what really counts and so awards and accolades have far more gravitas will create far more traction with your profile um, than just posting more shit on facebook um, Live appearances, right? Having a great speaker's kit and a video showreel and a very clear message that you communicate as a founder uh, and having some video and photographic evidence of that. So when people go to About Us, there's you on stage in front of audiences, etc., which again just ticks this subtle little box in the audience's mind that, oh, okay, other people have deemed you worthy of an audience. I don't need to go through that evaluation process myself anymore. I'll just take it as a given that, you know, you're a go-to person. So there are these subtle cues that while on one hand could look like we're trying to big note ourselves or big up ourselves, what we're really just doing is demonstrating the truth so our audience can make a more accelerated decision about who we actually are. Um, the key is never faking it. Right. Never try and pretend through your profile that you are something that you're not, that you're bigger than you are, then you're more successful than you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It'll often have the inverse effect. So, for example, I know a lot of one man businesses that on their about us use the royal we as though they're like a mini price waterhouse coopers or something. Um, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it because most times people can work out that actually this is just you doing this thing. And once they work that out, if they can see that 
in the past or as part of what you do, you've tried to essentially deceive people into thinking you're something you're not, that new idea doesn't go away in their mind. So we recommend being really transparent and of course going through these steps to develop a business that you can be totally transparent and, and proud about. Um, if you are, so for, let's imagine Simon Sinek, right? If Simon Sinek, the start with why guy, um, didn't want a business, didn't want a consultancy, just wanted to be him. Um, and you know, he was the fifth most watched Ted talk and he was the author speaker commentator, but it was just him. Do you think anyone's going to mind that it's just him? If he's about up, us page said, hi, I'm Simon Sinek. I don't want a big team. I just love being me. Um, and if you want me to come in and, you know, be a, give a keynote talk or work with your team, I'm happy to help because it's just me. Here's my awards. Here's my accolades. Here's me in Inc and Forbes and the Huffington Post and working with Coke and all these brands. No one's going to care. So it's, I would really recommend not pretending and instead focusing on building out the assets um, where you're known, like trusted and respected for exactly who you are um, and what you are. And so that's probably the final point I'd make on that. Focus on awards and accolades, live appearances, um, and having your content sharp enough to be distributed through, through third-party media before circling back to social media. Because the social media is really just the distribution where you want to share that other stuff anyway. Mm, that makes good sense. And I, I think to underscore something you said around, you know, just being who you are, oftentimes when you look um, at those characteristics, they can really be some of your unique selling advantages or your unique positions. I, I, I know we do that with, um, with System Hub. We, we don't chase features. Um, we, we focus on the idea of, uh, in business systems and processes like complexity is the enemy of a systemized business. So what you actually want is simplicity. So we don't chase features. Our, the aim of the game for us is to reduce features to get it as streamlined as possible. And that just then resonates with our audience. Cause we know, you know, as we perfected our pitch, one of the reasons people select us is because of the simplicity and ease of use. So all we do is we, we wrap it in. Now that's not always the case, but nine times out of 10, it, it can actually become a benefit. And, and we would recommend, well, what we do for our business and we recommend to our clients is that every quarter run a formalized meeting. If it's just you or bring your team involved or whatever it is to work out how can, how you can simplify even more. Cause the moment you hire another team member, the moment you launch another product, um, the complexity law starts to come into play, which is for every new element you bring into your business, it exponentially increases the number of nodes or hubs that uh, have to reference each other in the business. So if you've got two people working in a business, well, there's only one way communication. If you bring in one more person, there's now three ways. If you bring in four people, there's now eight ways. If you bring in five people, I forget what it is. I think it's like 32 ways mm. and so on. You add one more product, they all have to talk about and that compounds logarithmically. Add another product and it starts to get out of control. So we're constantly looking at how do we simplify? How do we simplify? Because you can have a fast growth accelerating business and, and that's what we're known for engineering. But if you're not simultaneously looking at systemizing and organizing the operational efficiency designed to facilitate that growth, um, your engine will blow up. It's like revving it to the red line and living there for too long, or you'll just destroy any capacity for profit gain through your high operational costs that are just showing up as as chaos. So the thing I love about Systems Hub is that it really is an antidote to chaos. Mm, I think what I love about this whole approach is where we're priming the pump at every step as you're going through this key person of influence. And then the last step, that idea of the partnerships, yeah. now you're at a point where you can handle the extra capacity. Cause if you don't do all of the stuff beforehand, imagine if you landed the deal with IBM or something like that, or, 
you know, you, you got picked up on Oprah or whatever the case is, you, you, you break your business because you haven't got everything else in place. But yeah, how, how annoyed would you be if you got picked up on Oprah and you had 100,000 people from around the world want to work with you and you were selling your time in $150 increments and none of them could work with you and, you know, that was your moment, that was your yeah. opportunity. You know, yeah. Simon Siddick had his moment on YouTube when his talk went viral. We had some, and this happens, right? So we've got some accountant clients of ours, um, Ben and Harvey from Inspire Business. Um, we have done a lot of work with them over the last sort of four years and specifically around developing um, campaigns and video campaigns and Facebook cascading video funnels. So we get into some reasonably complex stuff once our clients have got the books and the blogs and the podcasts and all the other stuff. Uh, one of their videos, because again, we recommend identifying what are some of the hot spots in the calendar year for your audience you want to focus on. And for them, it was the budget, right? So um, they put out this video on the budget. It was actually Kerry Packer talking about um, uh, legal uh, tax efficiency and, and going up against the, I can't remember what it was, not the Senate inquiry, that would be American, but uh, you know, the government. And um, anyway, this video of theirs went viral to the tune of 40,000 shares, 4 million views. Uh, and this is all in their account. They can now remarket and retarget to those people. And that was a huge breakthrough. But you got to be in it to win it. The fact was is that they leveraged their brand that expanded from a little two-man shop in Brisbane to having uh, a team in Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney, so when that opportunity flood came, they had the team, they'd grown from a team of two to a team of 12 and the infrastructure to, to handle it. So you, you're spot on. And I think um, with that last thing, oftentimes for business owners, those opportunities are coming up more frequently than they recognize. It's just that they're so focused in on the operations and the running of the business that even if that opportunity did fall in their lap or they happened to notice that they wouldn't be able to take advantage of it. So I think that's, that's kind of like the real, the real key here. What are the, the final point just here again, 80, 20, um, if there's any ways to leverage this idea of partnerships and, uh, yeah. you know, engineer this, cause some of the things are just going to be fortuitous, but some of it we can engineer. I'd love, yeah. love for some insight there. Right. So the first thing to do, is to step back and realize that only key people of influence have the opportunity to do any way decent joint ventures, partnerships, and alliances, right? Until you're a key person of influence, you're mucking around in, a, in, in the kid's pool and you would be better off deploying your energy to nailing the other four principles first, right? So the idea of partnerships is um, how do you go play with the cool kids that have already kind of cracked it um, so you end up in that world. It's kind of like lining up in a restaurant uh, to get into a restaurant, right? Um, the only reason you would line up is to get into the restaurant, right? And yet a, a lot of small businesses are kind of waiting their turn, waiting for their shot in the line and, and maybe like the maitre d' comes out with a little plate of bread and some oils to kind of let you just nibble on while you're out there in the rain kind of waiting to be let into the restaurant. And they're often out there so long they forget that the whole reason that they were lining up in the first place was to get into the restaurant. Um, it was to play that big game. It was to create that big breakthrough. It was to have that real impact. And so often a lot of business owners settle. So the first thing to zoom back out and, and to recognize is don't, settle. It's like getting comfortable with the paint smell in a freshly painted room. We get used to discomfort really, really, really quickly. Um, so one of the problems though with stepping back and realizing that actually we've got really big goals and we've actually got really big dreams and we actually feel like you know, we're here to do more than just break even and grind and struggle and kind of have have to have 99% of our focus on making money because that's just the paradigm what we're in. I mean, I've got a nine-week-old daughter now and one of the things that I'm most proud of is I don't go to work for money. I don't have to go to work for money. I go to work for purpose. And I think that is what you want to teach your kids but it's kind of also got to be true. So the problem with setting up these big goals again, which a lot of people forget about and they let go, is that it creates this 
almighty gap, this almighty tension, this almighty um, fear and inadequacy and, and not enough because all of a sudden to achieve those goals, the, the fundamental red light on the dashboard screaming at you is I don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough experience. It's this ultimate, I don't have enough warning light that starts to go on. And partnerships is the antidote to that little red light if you understand how to understand it. Um, the first thing, some perspective, um, I'm obviously in Australia as are you. Um, by OECD standards, we are in the top three wealthiest countries in the world. We're recognized as the most comfortable and financially well, well off people on the planet. So um, if the average Australian income is about $86,000, which it is, uh, if you go and look at the global income index, it puts us in the 99.7 percentile. Mm. of income earners and so when we start using language like i don't have enough what we need is the perspective to be able to come in and go actually that's not true it might feel true but it's not true and the way we approach partnerships is everything you think you're missing in your business whether it's cash or whatever it is somebody else has in such an abundance that they don't value it to anywhere near the same degree that you would value it, right? So if you think about it, someone who's dead broke struggling to pay their red is going to value $100 a hell of a lot more than Bill Gates is going to value the same $100 because he has an abundance of that thing. So let me give you a couple of examples around partnerships. One of them, a client of ours in Melbourne, Darren Finkelstein, sold boats. Um, super cool dude, very frustrated, stuck in his business. There was no way he was going to publish content or write a book. Anyway, we sold him on the benefits. He started trying it and the results were just like incredible. Um, so he went from just publishing videos and publishing a blog to deciding he was going to publish a book but it was going to cost him about five grand to have the cover designed and you know the internal layouts done. So 80-20 rule when it comes to partnerships, you want to think any new piece of asset you're creating or new value you're creating, you want to ask yourself, other than me, who else has the most to gain from its success? All right? So... Darren looked at this book that he was writing, which was all about, it wasn't about buying a boat. That was the drill bit. It was about getting your family out on the water to reconnect with family and friends. So it was all about quality time. His, his shift was, I'm not in the business of selling boats. I'm in the business of getting families the opportunity to connect uh, in ways that they hadn't done before. So he wrote the book, Honey, Let's Buy a Boat, which is all about selling the dream to the family of the family lifestyle. Now, if this book was to become successful, which it did, who would have the most to gain other than Darren and his business? And we wrote a big, big, big list. So that would be one of the steps. Who has the most to gain and write a list of 15 to 20? So one of the people on the list was an insurance company because if someone's reading a book on how to get my family out on the water, if they go ahead and buy the boat, they're going to need insurance. So on this hit list went Club Marine, which is Australia's top um, uh, insurance company. Darren picked up the phone, pitched the idea of this book. Short story long, they ended up paying him 15 grand to have the, some of their advertorial featured throughout the book for the first 3,000 copies. As a sweetener, they gave him a double page spread in their magazine um, and did an email about his book launch to, I think, their 80,000 people on database. I forget the details. You can just Google Gar Darren Finkelstein Dent podcast. I did a podcast with him. In fact, everyone I've mentioned, I've done a podcast about or, or with. And so all of a sudden, instead of going from, oh, I don't have the cash or I don't want to spend the cash, which is a better way to think about it on the, like from a retail paradigm, it's how do we leverage the intrinsic value because a lot of people are just wired to think that value equals money in the bank account 
But the moment you've produced a book or a piece of software, I mean, you've, you're putting together this incredible summit with all these speakers and all this audience. Obviously, there is intrinsic value inside that for all of your sponsors, etc. cetera. Um, another really quick example would be uh, Justine Coom, right? So Justine has a, had a marketing company that was doing about uh, 200 grand a year, just her as a consultant. She had a young family she had to support. The catch-22 was her target market were like the news corps, like big blue chip brands. But she was so busy doing all the delivery, it was going to cost her a couple of hundred grand to hire a salesperson that had the caliber, the gravitas, if you will, to be able to access that kind of market. So she was in a catch-22. She couldn't not do the delivery and do the, the biz dev because someone had to deliver and she couldn't hire the salesperson so she felt stuck at this kind of quarter of a million dollar level. What we did is we're like, okay, who has the most to gain from the value that you've already got? So she helps big businesses completely rethink their marketing and so they want to do a hell of a lot more with their marketing. Who had the most to gain from that? One of the people on the list was Salesforce because Salesforce uses, it is obviously a, a major CRM for sales and marketing. She goes and inspires businesses that are using Salesforce to do even more stuff with it. So long story short, she ended up working on her pitch, working with our pitching mentor to get that right, went and pitched Salesforce. They ended up having her come in and train her uh, their teams of 40 full-time salespeople based here in Australia on the features, advantages, and benefits of a product and service, right? not, the, not the functional stuff, the whole. And all of a sudden, she went from having no salespeople and a little business to having a full-time salespeople of 40 businesses, uh, sorry, 40 people um, selling her products and services on her behalf. She went from a 25% conversion on leads that she was talking to, to a 100% conversion of leads that Salesforce sent her that were already pre-sold, and her business grew very rapidly over a two-and-a-half-year period to about five-and-a-half million bucks a year. She now takes six months a year off, um, and the last project that she worked on with her kids was building a cabin in Falls Creek because that was a dream of her by hand. Right. So like, mm. like that was her dream. That's why she did it. It was hard. This wasn't easy. Catch 22s, not enough. Like looking after a family, all these sorts of things. But she had a why. She had a reason. And that drove her to think outside the box. And I think for everybody listening to this, you, you've got to have a why. You've got to have a reason. Becoming a key person of influence, becoming a go to brand, being a challenger business isn't easy business isn't easy um it's kind of one of these things you got to lean into it you got to want it you got to have a why that's really calling you forth and if you do and you're willing to lean into it certainly my experience and the experience of a lot of our clients in our tribe is everything starts to get a hell of a lot more fun and a hell of a lot easier the moment you really commit to making a dent in the universe. It is not fun or easy in struggle, commoditized sort of business land. And yet if you follow these five principles, like pitch, publish, product, profile, partnerships, in that order, if you do it well, it's probably going to take you 12 months to build it all out properly to even a basic level that you'll then want to continue to develop over the coming uh, years. Um, but we see no faster way to accelerate the growth of your business than by focusing on on those five things. And I think doing that while making sure the systems are underpinned with a platform like yours is just a no-brainer, hence the partnership. Yeah, I think um, people are going to want to dig into this a lot more because I've seen it many times with many clients and colleagues that have gone through the program got amazing success and results. Um, so it's definitely one that they want to check out. We're going to pop a link where people can go ahead and I believe we're going to give everybody a free copy of the book. Is that right? Am I jumping the gun? Mate, all I have to offer is this talk. We have nothing else. Yeah. Um, 
mate, we would love to shower your audience uh, in gifts and awesomeness, um, depending on where in the world they are. Um, so if you're not in Sydney or New South Wales, let's say, um, go to uh, dent, as in make a dent in the universe dot global. So dent dot global forward slash start. Um, yes, you'll be able to get an ac access the key person of influence book. Um, we also have a digital scorecard, which kind of quantifies your ability to influence because influence is like, well, what is it? Well, 50,000 leaders now use that tool to help benchmark their influence and give them a sense of exactly where they're at now and what they should be focusing on to kind of leverage their return or their focus, clarify their focus. So you get the book, you can do that. It'll also connect you to our social media, video guides, checklists, tools, the podcast, things of that nature. Um, and uh, as well, you can follow the rabbit hole to local uh, events and courses and programs and consulting and advisory, kind of whatever you need. Um, we've also acquired a variety of business services now. So if you need a book published or if you want video content created or if you want like digital scorecards or websites built, like we've been acquiring um, a variety of businesses to help our clients with those um, uh, with that asset production as well. If you're in New South Wales uh, and you'd like to come and meet with me, come along. I run a, a workshop once a month. Uh, if you just go to the key, uh, go to kpiworkshop.com. Um, so it's pretty easy to remember. Just go to kpiworkshop.com. And again, um, it's free. You can register for that. Love to meet with you. And we'll make sure you get access to a free copy of the book and uh, all the other jam as well. I mean, ultimately for me, my passion is, is business. I, I personally want to, yes, I want to leave a legacy, but while I'm here, I want to make the most of the times that we're in. Um, and one of my dreams was to build a tribe around me of, of like-minded entrepreneurs that wanted to do the same thing. Um, and I'm very fortunate, I guess, in the sense that the key person of influence program with the caliber of people that it attracts and um, the kind of results that it creates has, has very much allowed me to you know, create this super cool um, community of influencers to the point where this is so much bigger than, than me um, or my business partner or any of our team now. Um, we see business as being pretty complicated and so to have created an ecosystem full of thought leaders in kind of almost every area of business you could imagine um, is kind of cool. So whatever challenges you're struggling with, uh, come to one of the workshops, let me know where you're at and love to see if we can help. Perfect. I'll put the links beneath this session or wherever people are listening to the session so they can follow those rabbit holes. Definitely highly recommended from my end and a big thank you, Glenn, for your time today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.